All right. So um, thank you guys so much for coming to this Go Deep session tonight. Uh, we've been doing a number of different topics lately. And um, this is one that um, Maria came to me a little bit ago saying that she'd um, love for us to do together. And um, we're going to be talking about death and dying. And so this is something that is obviously very relevant on many different fronts in our um, in our everyday normal lives as humans, but especially in this um, moment in time that we find ourselves. And so, um, you know, some of what we'll talk about will be more sort of theoretical, but a lot of what especially Maria will talk about will be very practical of just how do we have conversations and talk to our loved ones and and make sure that if we find ourselves in a, in a position where decisions need to be made, that our wishes are known and that we have people to support and care for us. Um, and I think one thing that I have always appreciated about the church at its best is that in the church, we can talk about death. You know, we serve a God who died. We don't, we do not have to, um, it's, I think it's understandable to fear death. And of course, grief and lament are a huge part of our faith as well. Um, but it's not a taboo subject in the Bible. It's not a taboo subject in our faith. And um, I think that the church can, can be a real gift to people in some ways for that. So I'm going to present first and talk a little bit from the bioethical side about um, the history of how we've understood death, which it didn't occur to me until I started studying some of this, but that has changed over time. We'll look at a couple of case studies that brought up complicated issues around, around death. Um, and then Maria is going to take us through some um, um, important, really important stuff around advanced care planning. So um, if you have questions or comments throughout the presentation, I'm perfectly fine with you interrupting me or jumping in and or we can have conversation at the end. Um, however people want to do that is just fine. So to start off, um, I have I actually my presentation is bookended by Mary Oliver poems. Would anyone like to read this poem if you can see it? This is called When Death Comes by Mary Oliver. Can we get a volunteer? Or do I need to read it? <laughs> I'll read it. I'll read it. Thanks, Andy. Uh -huh. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Thank you, Anderson. I appreciate you doing that. Um, I, I, this says a disclaimer, actually a couple we are talking about death and dying, so please, um, you know, be attentive to yourself and how things strike you and affect you throughout this presentation. If you need to do whatever it is to take care of yourself during or after this presentation, if you need to follow up with Maria or myself or another staff member, please let us know. Um, we know that these can be, we hope that this will be a generative conversation, but we know these are heavy topics. Also, 
Um, as I was putting this together, I realized, you know, my presentation mostly deals with instances in which a death is at least somewhat foreseeable and where medical intervention is or may be an option. And we know that that's not always how things work. We know that there are sudden, unexpected, or violent deaths that happen, and those just may not be, they may not fit with what we'll discuss tonight. So I just want to name that, that death as a phenomenon is deeply complex and that, um, We'll be grappling with some of that complexity, but certainly not all of it. So I want to talk a little bit about a brief history of death in medicine. I find a lot of this really fascinating. So in, until the last quarter of the 20th century, there was very little that physicians could do to alter the time and manner of death. Um, it started to change after World War II, and there was rapid development in medical technology. And that included um, a lot of interventions that we really take for granted today. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, mechanical ventilation, which we know has been something that we've talked about a lot lately with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Intensive care units were, are a relatively recent technology. Um, artificial nutrition and hydration, renal dialysis or kidney dialysis, organ transplantation, and more. These are all relatively recent developments in medical technology that make a big difference in when and how someone might die. And that led to, has led to lots and lots of ethical questions. And one of the, one of the sort of core questions is this question of ability versus obligation to prolong life. So because we can prolong life through these technologies, should we? And that's the crux of the ethical question. When should we use these technologies to extend life? Um, and and when, do we, when is there a different ethical obligation? And this, a lot of this comes from a book by one of my bioethics professors, Dr. John Moskop, who's at Wake Forest Baptist. One of the cases that really brought a lot of this into focus was with Karen Ann Quinlan. So in 1975, 21-year-old Karen Ann Quinlan oh. suffered a cardiopulmonary arrest. And it's a really, it's a sad story. She um, struggled with severe eating disorder. But she had this cardiopulmonary arrest and then was resuscitated. She was brought back and was hospitalized. Um, and doctors eventually determined that she was in a persistent vegetative state. And there are complex definitions around, um, around these things. And so when, when that determination was made, her parents requested that they remove the ventilator, but the physicians refused. And um, this became very controversial. The physicians felt like if they were to withdraw care, that they would be participating in, in killing someone, that that went against their code of ethics. The parents felt like Karen wouldn't want to live the way that she was living, and it became this struggle. And so this case was the catalyst for um, what you may have heard of living wills. So, and there are, um, was a lot of legislation that emerged from the Karen Ann Quinlan case to allow for people to um, there are a number of different advanced care planning documents, but to make their wishes for how they want to die or how, you know, what sorts of interventions they do or don't want um, at the end of their life, um, that became a, a, a more uh, legislated and regulated thing. Um, and the, um, the book by Dr. Moskop outlines kind of there, there are many different places in which there can be conflict and moral questions around end-of-life care. So the three categories that Dr. Moskop uses are internal conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, and public policy conflicts. And the different kinds of internal conflicts, this question versus it of, do I want to prolong my life via a difficult treatment, or do I want to have a better quality of life by foregoing treatment? So you might you know, some people might value having a longer time and some people might prefer to have a shorter time without a certain invasive treatment, um, but those, those can be very complex decisions. Um, the question of enduring pain in order to remain alert versus accepting sedation in order to manage pain, that's another very complex um, decision. Mm -hmm. Relying on loved ones to assist with treatment and daily needs versus foregoing treatment to relieve loved ones of caregiving obligations. And you can imagine that that is not only an internal conflict, but an interpersonal conflict. And we all ha have these stories of loved ones who don't want to be a burden, but the family wants that burden or, you know, vice versa, it can be very complex. 
And then we'll talk a little more about this in a minute, but trust in professional caregivers' recommendations versus suspicion of their intentions. So when it comes oh. to healthcare professionals, trust is vital, especially in some of these um, end of life decisions. When it comes to public policy conflicts, there's a debate of natural death. What do we, what, how do we define natural death? Um, there's a ongoing debate about physician, sometimes you've heard it called physician assisted suicide. Many people now call it physician aid in dying. Um, and then what's called the futility debate. At what point, you know, could a medical technology be used, but it wouldn't have any real impact? And uh, these are just things that come up in, in how laws are, are implemented, how public policy is implemented, that make real, ha have real effect on, on individual people's and families' lives. So another case that I want to talk about, because it does address some of these issues um, more in a more complex way, is the case of Jahai McMath. So, um, and this is just, it's a it's just a really sad case. So in December 2013, 13-year-old Jahai McMath had a tonsillectomy at Oakland Children's Hospital. So not, I mean, I've actually, I still have my tonsils, but I know many people have had tonsillectomies. But about an hour after she woke up from surgery, she started spitting up blood and the family, you know, tried to get doctors and nurses attention, but um, say that they ignored their concerns or felt like they were just brushing them off. Eventually, Jahai's oxygen dropped and her heart stopped and um, they were able to bring her back, but then two days later, she was declared brain dead. And that, just a pause, like something that I have found really interesting, but kind of disturbing too, is just that how we define death has changed over time. Once upon a time, if your heart stopped and you stopped breathing, like that was, there wasn't any other definition of death. And now we have this uh, definition of brain death that has come along with these medical technologies. Um, and so that was, Jahai was declared brain dead and a death certificate was issued on January 3rd, 2014. Um, and I can, if people are, I, I, some of my interests may seem a little morbid to some people, but this article is actually really well done um, from the New Yorker that gets into the complexity of this case. So if anyone's interested, I can send it later. Um, that's not the end of the story. So two days later, an air evacuation service that was paid for through a GoFundMe airlifted Jahai to New Jersey, where laws allow for religious objections to brain death criteria. And Jahai remained there on a ventilator receiving artificial nutrition and hydration until 2018, um, when internal bleeding from liver and kidney failure led doctors to remove her from life support. So <clears throat> this was a um, really sad, brutal case, right? Um, and this is Jahai with her family. And uh, this, I thought that this quote from Nyla Winkfield, who's Jahai's mother, was really interesting. She, saw, she asked, kind of asked herself and wondered aloud, if the hospital had been more compassionate, would we have fought so much? So this is a pretty stark example of how if you don't have trust in medical professionals, it can be really, it just can make things so much harder than they need to be. Um, and there's a lot more to like the medical details of this case that make it very complex. But what I really wanted to point out is the issue of racism in death and dying, which is obviously present in more broadly in healthcare in general. But what Nyla said was, no one was listening to us and I can't prove it, but I really feel in my heart, if Jahai was a little white girl, I feel we would have gotten a little more help and attention. Um, and this article said, has this, um, some statistics says African Americans are twice as likely as whites to ask that their lives be prolonged as much as possible, even in cases of irreversible coma, a preference that likely stems from fears of neglect. A large body of research has shown that black patients are less likely to get appropriate medications and surgeries than white ones are, regardless of their insurance or education level, and more likely to receive undesirable medical interventions like amputations. So a lot of people were very critical of Jahai's mother's decisions um, to keep her on the ventilator, but um, several bioethicists pushed back and said, you're completely ignoring the social context in which this is happening, and it's deeply relevant in this case. Um, and just to name that in the history of medicine, so some just sort of name, names to know, J. Marion Sims is often lauded as, having, as being the father of gynecology. He developed his techniques by performing operations on enslaved black women, uh, often without anesthesia. 
Um, the Tuskegee syphilis study is infamous for um, uh, sort of not treating black men for syphilis while telling them that they were being treated. Um, Henrietta Lacks was a black woman whose um, cells were used and became, were, were huge in medical research, but she received no credit or compensation or nor did her family. And there's a long history of forced sterilization of black, brown, and indigenous women. And then with the current COVID-19 pandemic, there are well-publicized racial disparities in infection and um, death. So this is a, I just feel like it's really important to name the role that race and socioeconomic status can play in end of life decisions. Um, and I know I'm flying through some like really big and deep topics, but you know, we are, we're, we are trying to talk about something really big. So just some issues that I think are important to think about specifically as Christians when we're talking about like the ethics of death and dying is, you know, the question we believe in the sanctity of life because God creates life, God gives us life. Um, but I think it's a valid question to ask if, if life is sacred because of its length or its quality. And when those things conflict, how do we, how do we handle that? There's sort of the basic question of was death part of God's plan for creation? There, there are arguments to be made that, um, you know, the scripture says the wages of sin is death. And was that always how things were supposed to be? And if so, what does that, what does that mean? But it's, it's very true that death is an integral part of creation at this point, regardless of the original plan. Um, there's this question of autonomy and individualism, and there's a lot here, but, but you know, giving people choices, but recognizing too that not, no person is an island, right? And especially in the Christian faith, we believe that we are all like deeply interconnected with one another and with God. And so how do we make choices um, that work for individuals, but also for the people around them? And that ties into this discernment in community as a value within Christianity. This is kind of an odd um, phrase, but I, I, it was an article that I read that was about what, is it, what does it mean to have a cruciform or cross-shaped imitating Jesus on the cross, um, bioethics of, of living and dying, um, and, and how, do we, how do we follow Jesus? Not, and I want to be careful because I don't I don't want to advocate for any kind of like martyrdom or saying that, you know, some person's suffering is somehow, I don't believe that any suffering, but God, I believe that we can grow out of suffering, but I don't, I don't believe that God makes us suffer in order for us to grow. I just don't. Um, and then importantly, the pursuit of justice and mercy. And then I, I like this quote from this book on moral medicine. Um, that I have. It's because we know that God does not abandon us even in death, we can remain present to each other without the illusion that we can master death. And I think that's a lot of what Maria is about to talk about is about is um, this, this uh, resisting the denial of death and engaging with one another compassionately and lovingly around our wishes. Um, and this is George Rudeau's Saints and the Crucifixion. Um, I have one more Mary Oliver poem, and does anybody want to read this, or do you want me to read it, and then I'll turn it over to Maria? I'll, I'll read it. All right, this is in Blackwater Woods. This is one of my favorite of her poems. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads me back to this. The fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. And that's what I have. And uh, Maria, you can take it from here. Hello, everyone. So good to be with you. Pastora Sara, I am so grateful for your uh, bringing the lens of ethics when we talk about death and dying because that it's, um, that
that is a, a, a very important grounding uh, for us to be able to get to a place where we can talk about death and dying with, um, with a level of comfort and peace. Uh, and so I'm grateful for you, Pastora, for bringing that lens into our conversation. It's, it's critical and beautifully done. Thank you. You're, you're my favorite ethicist. <laughs> Um, so, so friends, I, I bring with, with our time, for our time today, I bring stories, right? I'm, I think I'm a little, I did not know that I'm a little bit of a storyteller. <laughs> and so I, I do have a few slides that I like to share with you, mainly to sort of keep me on track and guide me um, a little bit through the conversation. And so I'm going to share some personal stories that got me to where I am now at a place where I can have these conversations. And so I'm gonna open my presentation and share with you. And can you guys see that? Not yet. Not yet? Uh, only see you. You only see me? Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me try That's this lovely. again. Okay, let's share the screen. We have to take it by the numbers. <laughs> Okay, there it is. Okay. And so I'm gonna uh -huh. oh, there it is. From the beginning. I'm learning so much. Pastora is teaching me so much about all this technical stuff. <laughs> so can you see that? Mm -hmm. Very good. We're good? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about advanced care planning, which is part of the work that we do here at Baptist Hospital. Here at the hospital, chaplains are the ones that um, provide the education on advanced care planning and um, just sharing uh, information with our patients and our families about having the conversation. And all of that work is grounded on the fact that the conversation is the critical part of the process. And that it is in the conversation when we're able to give the gift of love to those um, we love. And so that's just a little bit of who I am and all of you know me. Um, and so I begin with, um, as I mentioned, with my story and, um, and my first experience with death and dying. I was 16 years old. It was in 1973, 16 or so. And it was with my father. My father was a Korean War veteran. And uh, at age 44, he had terminal cancer. Uh, it all stemmed from his injuries that he sustained in the war. And what my father, I call him Papi, what Poppy did for us is that for the whole time he was um, ill and very much aware that he was going to die, Poppy spent that last year of his life preparing us for when the time came. So, so he taught us how to, um, how to be able to have the conversations about end of life um, in a way that removed fear not the grief, not the sadness, not the sorrow, but the fear so that we can be with him at the bedside and love on him on his very last days. And so I remember having these conversations with Papi and the ways in which he wanted his care to be delivered. And so as a, as a, a Korean War soldier, he liked his pajamas freshly starched and clean and he loved being clean shaven and he liked his um, hands manicured and he loved his cologne and back then in medical institutions you could wear cologne and so my my aunts and my grandmother will spray some of his favorite cologne on the linen so when people will come into the into the room it will smell fresh and it was always bright and lit and he always kept snacks and food because his room was a place of hospitality. And so I remember his primary nurse, Natasha, will come into the room and take naps 
in the room and there was always chocolate for Natasha in the room and always <laughs> snacks for the kids in the room. And so, and so he began to prepare us and prepare the space for when that time comes. So that was my very first experience with having the conversation about death and dying. And so all of this many years later, little did I know that I will be doing this work um, as I witnessed my father's having conversation with his um, army chaplain uh, back then. And so I'm grateful for that experience because it really grounds um, the ways in which I navigate this beautiful ministry. And so in what I have witnessed in my work now decades later is how the gift of the conversation and the gift of being able to talk about death and dying um, it's really prepares our loved ones to have peace at a time when we need it the most so that we can be uh, fully present and, and share our love and our connection with our loved one at end of life. Uh, and so all of that grounded my need and my desire to have a conversation with my daughters. And a lot of what Pastora Sarah shared about the um, life prolonging measures are some of the things that I personally have struggled with and use that information from an ethics perspective to talk to my daughters about what my values are and what my wishes and my desires are when I get to the point of illness and I cannot recover fully. And so, as many of you know, I'm from the island of Puerto Rico, and I love my rice and my beans, and I love my salsa music. And so, this is what I share with my daughters multiple times. If I get so sick that I cannot enjoy my rice and my beans, you know it's time to let me go. If I get so sick and I cannot recover to the point where I can salsa dance, it's time for me to go. If I get so sick and do not recover to any sense of quality of life where I can enjoy the sun and the beach and the ocean and the hot sand and witnessing the palm tree swaying to the breeze, it's time to let me go right? I do not want to be artificially, um, my life supported artificially with um, artificial nutrition and hydration because I do not want to feel bloated. I do, that does not look good. I don't want to be laying on the bed, and this is my father, right? I don't want to be laying in the bed looking not well. I want to make sure that my lipstick is on. I want to make sure that my eyebrows are tweezed and my nails are done and that my bun is very nice and that my pajamas look nice and fresh. Do not have me laying in the bed looking any kind of way because I want lots of people to come and see me. And so make sure that my feet are pedicured and that my skin is nice and moisturized. And so I have this conversation with my three beautiful daughters. They're now 41, 39, and 37. And I've had these conversations multiple times. This is not a one-time conversation to the point where they're like, okay, Mabel, we know enough, right? And so, and at one point they said, Mabel, we don't want to make the decisions for you. And I said, you're not making any decisions. I'm telling you what to do because I'm still running the show, right? And so your job is to make sure that if I'm not able to articulate what those wishes are, that you honor my wishes and my desires. And so I'm telling you in advance, just in case I'm not able to speak those myself. And so we have these conversations. And so here we are at the time of COVID-19. My two youngest live in New York City. My oldest one lives in Hawaii. Two weeks ago, my youngest daughter gathered with her sisters virtually and had a conversation about, okay, Mabel is in North Carolina. We are here in New York and Hawaii. 
Mabel lives by herself. What are we gonna do? Because Mabel works at a medical center. She is in the trenches caring for patients dying of COVID. What are we going to do if something happens to Mabel? So they began to have those conversations and for the very first time they were able to articulate that they had some concerns about me being here and they being very far away. Now, my daughters are my healthcare agents. They are the ones that I have named to be the ones in my advanced care planning to be my healthcare agents in the event I'm not able to articulate my wishes. And so this is what my daughters decided to do. Well, what we need to do is we need to make sure that Mabel's house is properly equipped in the event that she has to be quarantined and people need to come to the house to care for Mabel. And so for two weeks solid, this is what I get. A case of soup, a case of broth, a case of tissue, holes, cough drops, Tylenol, flu medication. Um, let's see, <laughs> a microwave because I don't own a microwave, a mini refrigerator, <laughs> tissue. Let's see what it oh, two cans of oxygen. Yeah, <laughs> oxygen. Uh, let's see, cracker soup, broth, oh, tea. I like ginger tea, so they sent me a little case of ginger tea. So every day I'm getting these packages delivered at my front door. And then we gather one Saturday evening and they said, Mabel, this is your quarantine care supplies. You are not to consume those. You are supposed to stash those away in the event that you get sick and you have to quarantine. And so I had to set all of these things up to make my daughters happy and give them peace and show them where I had set up the little fridge and the, oh, they sent me a humidifier and, um, and VIX. And, um, and I have to set all this up in a little corner in my room to make sure that I have everything I needed if until they were able to get here and care for me. The reason why my daughters were able to do all of that, it's because they are at a point where they feel very comfortable talking about death and dying. Now, beloved, remember that two of my daughters lived in New York City where they witnessed a lot of death due to COVID-19. So this is their point of reference. And so they are planning and preparing, not hoping, of course, that I will get sick, but in the event that something happens, that gives them a sense of peace. And so my job was to receive it and appreciate it and welcome their concerns and their thoughts um, so that they can continue to feel and be at a place of peace. So the conversation, it's about connection, right? It's about feeling connected to the people we love and care for that will be with us to the very end and helping people share their wishes for care through the end of life. So my daughters know that artificial hydration and nutrition are not things that I, it's not what I want. If I am not going to recover fully, that's, and my body is naturally shutting down. Feeding me and hydrating me is going to interfere with the natural process of dying. And that is going to cause me discomfort. I want to be comfortable, right? And my daughters are very clear on that. There is a misconception that when we stop artificial hydration and nutrition, that we are starving our loved ones, when in reality, our bodies naturally go through the process where we're not processing food and naturally shutting down. And when we do certain um, measures of life prolonging measures, we're actually interfering with the natural process of dying. 
And so again, here we are in a pandemic in a level one trauma academic medical center, and we're not able to execute documents, complete advanced directives, healthcare power of attorneys, because we need to have witnesses. And as you know, we have restrictions in visitations. And in order to execute an advanced care document, a healthcare power of attorney or a living will, you have to have a notary and you have to have um, two witnesses. And because we cannot do that, the conversation becomes even that much more critical. Sitting down with your loved ones, not once, but multiple times, to have a conversation about your values, your wishes, and your desires in the event that something happens, that we may get sick, and we know how we want to be cared for, and we have to communicate that to our loved ones so they will know how to honor our wishes and our desires in the event we cannot do that for ourselves. And again, this is about us calling the shots in advance, right? Nobody makes any decisions. We just communicate our wishes and our desires. Um, so this pandemic, according to Alejandra Salemi, one of the uh, uh, writers for the Conversation Project, uh, she says that this pandemic has surfaced many truths and that the fragility of life, the importance of planning ahead, and the undeniable fact that we need each other, it's something that this pandemic has exposed. The pandemic does not discriminate. COVID-19 has not discriminated, beloved. So we know that the fragility of life in this time in which we find ourselves um, has it's, it's much more um, in our surface. It's much more present for us, that reality. And so giving our loved ones the peace, the gift of love and peace is crucial. And it is all grounded in the conversation. Again, it is in the conversation. It is not a one-time deal. I do have to remind my daughters um, that, you know, what my wishes are. I, I, I desire to be cremated. I don't want to burden my daughters with burials and caskets and all of that. And I want my remains, my ashes to be taken to Puerto Rico. I want to be in my island. And so they know all of that. They also know that if my body is so frail, and I am not going to recover to regain my quality of life and my heart was to stop, that cardiopulmonary resuscitation is really not what I want. Because if I am not going to regain my quality of life and my body is so frail, CPR, it's not really going to help me. It's not what I desire. That changes. That's very different for everybody. That is happens to be my wish. And that, that took a little bit of work uh, with my girls. That took a little bit of extra conversation but because I have to really explain what that looked like and what it means. And so it takes a lot of patience it takes, and it's all about love, because part of our job as we're having these conversations and we're extending the gift of peace at the end of life for our loved ones is, um, is to remove some of that fear so that we can, so that we can be um, and loved and care uh, for our beloved as they are at uh, experiencing end of life. And so who is going to speak for you, right? So I know that for me, my youngest daughter, Jessica, um, it's my primary healthcare agent. My secondary healthcare agent is my um, daughter, Melissa. They're both in New York City, but they, don't, they live in different boroughs. Jessica, it's easier to be accessible because she is permanently in, New, in Brooklyn, 
Melissa's an actor, so she's all over the place, and Nina Maite is in Hawaii too far away. So her job is to gather her sisters, to have those conversations, and to make sure that they are all on the same page. I have done something extra uh, with, with my wishes and my desires is that I have a death doula, a beloved colleague of mine, uh, Ji San, she is a Buddhist chaplain, is my death doula, and my daughters will have her in the event that something happened to help them navigate so they can be so they can be about the business of grieving and being daughters while G Sun navigates and helps them get through the process of my death. Um, we plan for everything. We make budgets, we make wedding plans, we plan for college, we plan when to have our children, we plan for retirement, which is a very intense process, but we do not prepare for end of life. And beloved, I see it here all the time when those unexpected deaths happen and the relatives do not know the wishes and the desires, it creates a tremendous amount of anguish and despair and fear, not knowing what to do. When we are able to have those conversations in advance, we are really giving the peace, the gift of peace to our loved ones because they already know what the wishes are. All they have to do is communicate them on our behalf. We have to change that. We have to get to a place where we can have those conversations and give ourselves permission to be patient and tender with ourselves as we have those conversations. That is not a one-time conversation. And so my invitation is to give your loved ones the gift of peace when they will need it the most at end of life um, so that they can be about the process of grieving and being at bedside making you comfortable and honoring and preserving our dignity as we are transitioning from one state of life into a very different state of life. Um, Roshi Joan Halifax, she is an expert in the work of death and dying. She is, she was actually my beloved death doulas, Rashi. Um, and she says that denial of death runs rampant through our culture. We're not comfortable talking about death and dying as Pastora Sarah um, shared with us uh, earlier. And leaving, and because of our denial, it leaves us woefully unprepared when it is our time to die. And our time to help others die, to be by the bedside. Uh, I, I treasured that time with my father when he was dying at age 44. And so we often aren't available for those who need us who need us to comfort them, to whisper beautiful things and memories in their ears as they're transitioning, because we're paralyzed as we are um, by anxiety and resistance and denial and fear, not able to be present to ourselves and to our loved one as they are dying. Um, this is a very beautiful book that Rashi Halifax has written, Being With Dying, Cultivating Compassion and Fearlessness in the Presence of Death. And that is my go-to, and I highly recommend it as a resource to prepare us to add tools to our tool bag to begin to have these conversations. And these are my resources that I use here at the medical center and I have used them with friends and colleagues as we sit down and talk about death and dying. Uh, the conversation project is exquisite. It's an exquisite resource. It provides you tips and tools 
on how to um, assess what your wishes and your desires are from CPR to artificial hydration and nutrition um, to talk about all of that and, and help us reflect so that we can share that information with our loved ones. Um, gotplans123.org, that it's, uh, that's a, a another exquisite resource filled with resources and tips and tools on how to have the conversation. Um, palliative care and hospice facilities use that resource a, a lot. And then of course, my go-to, there's many books written uh, about death and dying and how to have this conversation, exquisite books written, but this is my favorite. Um, and so I offer that as a resource to you.